This is MPB News. Hi, this is Ashley Norwood. Thanks for checking out the At Issue podcast. If you like what you hear, please like, rate, or leave a comment. Subscribe to this and other MPB News productions like Mississippi Edition to stay up to date. Don't forget to tell your friends about us, too. You can also watch At Issue on MPB TV Friday nights at 730 or on mpbonline.org. Thanks for listening. Hello and thank you for joining us. I'm Wilson Stribling. Welcome to another edition of At Issue, where we discuss and debate the issues facing the state of Mississippi and how these issues impact you. It's the fourth week of the 2021 Mississippi legislative session and lawmakers were up against their first big deadline. Any bill that did not make it out of committee by Tuesday has little chance of becoming law this session. Bills that did clear that hurdle are subject to further review, discussion and debate on the floor of each chamber. In the Senate, lawmakers passed two education bills they believe will help teachers enter the profession in Mississippi and entice them to stay in the classroom. Senate Bill 2267, authored by Republican Senator Dennis DeBar of Leakesville, would require the State Department of Education to issue a Mississippi license to any teacher with a valid out-of-state license within two weeks of applying. Teachers receiving reciprocity would still be subject to a background check before being hired by a district under a separate statute. Senate Bill 2305, authored by Democratic Senator David Blunt of Jackson, would provide annual grants to new teachers to pay down student loan debt. He explained the bill on the Senate floor. You graduate from college, and this is a staggering statistic, the average Mississippi college student loan debt is between thirty-five and $37,000. So you, most Mississippians, graduate from college with significant student loans. Uh, then we say to those, uh, those young people graduating from college, if you agree to come teach in a Mississippi school, we will pay down your student loan debt. And then the teacher or the, the, the person enters the teaching profession and they teach, at the end of the year, they go to the Office of Financial Aid and with a piece of paper it says, I taught the state of Mississippi writes a check to that loan provider and the principal on that loan is reduced by that amount. That's the way a loan repayment program works. So uh, what we have here are a, pro a program that will uh, benefit every single school district in the state. Every single school district in the state is eligible. It's a three-year program we propose where the first year we'll pay a certain amount, the second year we'll pay a little bit more, the third year we'll pay a little bit more. Uh, we, have a, we do have an additional amount for a critical need shortage district as opposed to another district, but again, I want to say every district is eligible. Uh, and we have a loan repayment program. We think it will help attract people to the profession, help people, uh, along with the raise that we've already passed, help people pay down their college student loans and give them an incentive to stay in the classroom. Both education bills now move to the House for further review. The Senate also approved a bill to expand connectivity and accessibility of reliable high-speed Internet across the state. Senate Bill 2798 would let energy companies lease so-called dark fiber to any Internet service provider. Dark fiber is network infrastructure that's already in place but not being used. Lieutenant Governor Delbert Hoseman says this measure is part of a series of efforts to dissolve the digital divide in Mississippi especially in rural communities. Uh, we need to have broadband in every home that we can have it in. Uh, our broadband bill is out from the Senate, and I assume the House bill will be forthcoming shortly, and we will immediately go to conference. Uh, I do not want delay in emphasizing the fact that people who are in unserved areas have access to the Internet. So you will see that. As we go forward, uh, this will apply to Intergy, which runs basically from Wilkinson, South Mississippi, all the way to Memphis, and uh, just about to Memphis. So it will then open up a Highway 49 or thereabouts, roughly, corridor for the Delta to allow them to have this, uh, this new broadband internet access to them based off what basically, uh, in meeting with the uh, power companies, it costs very, very little to, in to enlarge the access the number of glass uh, circular items that are in there. Most of these are 143. 
of them and they're only using maybe one or two or three or 10 or 15 of them. There's a lot of access uh, capacity there. Hoseman says all revenue derived from leasing the dark fiber would be used to reduce utility costs for ratepayers. The bill now moves to the House for consideration. Advancing out of the Senate Finance Committee is a bill to create the Mississippi Medical Cannabis Act. It would establish a program separate from the ballot initiative voters approved in November to legalize medical marijuana by way of a constitutional amendment. It was initially positioned as a backup if Initiative 65 is struck down by the state Supreme Court. The initiative is before the high court after the mayor of Madison challenged whether the signatures were legally gathered. Like Initiative 65, the bill, authored by Republican Senator Kevin Blackwell of South Haven, makes medical marijuana available to those with debilitating conditions. But it also has some differences, such as requiring regulation by the State Department of Agriculture and a 10 percent sales tax on marijuana products. Blackwell and Democratic Senator David Blunt of Jackson debated the purpose of the bill in committee. Assuming that the Constitution stays the way it is, or what we're doing is really just setting up two parallel tracks, two different regulatory schemes run by different agencies with different requirements and a provider or a patient can avail themselves of either one because there's nothing in this bill that can change what's in the Constitution. And uh, the, it's, it's it, as you know, it's very specific what's in the Constitution, what the money can be used for, what the requirements are, what the patient uh, qualifications are, that the money cannot go to the general fund, and all that stuff. We can't do anything about that with a bill. So are we just setting up two parallel regulatory structures that a patient or somebody in the, in the marijuana business can choose to do either one and if we are, why would a, someone who was in the medical marijuana business want to fool with any of this stuff when they've got a constitutional provision that doesn't set these uh, fees or anything else? Well, that, that's what set things out in the business world. That you've got choices. Uh, I, as, as a business person, I think 65 is unconstitutional. And I say that because my business is not protected. Your real estate business is not protected. The farmers are not protected, but yet we've taken this one product and this one industry and we're protecting it in the Constitution. I think that's a violation of equal, the Equal Protection Act. Well, that horse has left the barn, Senator Blackwell. I'm sorry? That horse has left the barn. It I mean, have, I, but, I, mean but, I appreciate your points, but I mean, but, but, but you know, that's... 65 is also in front of the Supreme Court. So what happens if 65 is struck down? And, and we don't have something in place. We've already know that about 73% of the people want m medical cannabis. Mm -hmm. So this bill will, would allow them to have that, that process, plus the tax revenue that if is generated by 65, it, it goes to the industry. It, it, does, goes, it doesn't go to the taxpayers. No, it doesn't I, benefit anybody but them. Well, it goes to the health department to administer the program. And, you know, we could debate whether that's the way it should work, but... Sure. But, but that's what, so my question is, if 65 it remains in the Constitution, then uh, what, what's going to be the impact of this legislation? Well, under this, with the guidelines, people, if they're supposed to get 20 milligrams of THC in a product, uh -huh. they're going to get 20 milligrams. Under 65, hey, whatever's in the joint's in the joint. So if you got but, but, uh, but, herbicides, but that, but, insecticides, well, hey, have at it. But but 65 is the Constitution, and so I mean, can I, don't I just I can choose as as a as a patient or somebody in the marijuana business, I can say, well, here's a regulatory structure over here that's in the Constitution. I can choose that, right. or here's another one over here. I can choose that, but they're both going to they're both going to exist and be parallel to each other. So they, they may, and that's, that's somebody's choice. That's, it's my choice as a businessman if I want to get into become a cultivator or if I want to have a dispensary. So it's also my choice as a, a patient where I go and get my certificate filled. So if you're a businessman, you can say, well, I could pay this big licensing fee and have my product I sell taxed at a higher rate, or I could not. Yeah, because I got a quality product, but, 
we can argue, we we can go around in circles on okay. this. But all right, I, I wish we. Were, I wish we'd been having this discussion last year, but I appreciate it. Thank 18 you, would have been a good year to have done it. But. The Democratic Senator John Horn is also on the Finance Committee. He's a supporter of Initiative 65 and believes the bill was drafted to create an avenue for the state to get money out of the new industry. In Initiative 65, money generated by the sale of marijuana products goes back to the program to help the health department run it. In the Senate bill, Horn says marijuana tax revenue would go to the early learning collaborative, dual enrollment, and other scholarship programs. Yes, uh, I, because there are no requirements for um, money going into the state general fund or going into specific programs other than the operation of the medical marijuana program itself, I believe that uh, the intent of, of the folks who sponsored the legislation uh, and who are trying to get it working through the process is uh, that so that we can get uh, some revenue that would go to, in this case, uh, programs dealing with education from early childhood education uh, all the way up through um, uh, scholarships for a community and for your college students. The bill is expected to be taken up on the Senate floor soon. On the House floor, lawmakers passed House Bill 307, a measure to allow the State Department of Health some flexibility to enter into contractual agreements with other state agencies or entities for the operation of the medical marijuana program. The measure now heads to the Senate for consideration. Republican Representative Sam Mims, chair of the Public Health and Human Services Committee, explains the bill. This was requested by the Department of Health. As you know, the medical marijuana, mar medical marijuana amendment passed uh, with 73, 74% of the vote this past November. And so the Department of Health, under the leadership, uh, is going to make this the most effective, most efficient uh, medical marijuana program in the U.S. And so they're committed to following the law. And so they are needing House Bill 307 to allow them to uh, to really have interact with other state agencies. We passed legislation a few years ago, as you know, that would not allow them to charge uh, other agencies for services. And so this would allow them, for example, uh, they will need to enter into a contract with the Mississippi Department of Revenue for the collection of sales taxes and possible the inspection of some processors. They may also need a contract with other state agencies as the Department of Agriculture and maybe the Department of Mental Health. So this will allow them a little, little bit of flexibility. And again, ladies and gentlemen, they are committed to following the law and making this the best, uh, most efficient and effective program in the United States. And, I'm, I'm, and I'm, I feel like they will uh, after working with them for so many years. Representative John Hines of Greenville says he's concerned about which agencies will be included in forthcoming partnerships with the Department of Health. He tells at issue producer Ashley Norwood he wants the legislature to assure a level of diversity and inclusion. About four years ago, when Arkansas first started talking about medical marijuana, one of the problems they had was they didn't include institutions, especially HBCUs. And so I wanted to make sure that HBCUs had an opportunity to participate in this endeavor. It's uh, a big money maker in other states and possibly going to be a big money maker here. But we have to ensure that the playing fields are level. So there are two land grant institutions, Mississippi State and Alcorn. So I wanted to make sure Alcorn was not left out. And so that's the reason I asked those questions. And when you say universities or institutions mm -hmm. participating, in what ways can they participate? Well, yeah. you always want an institution to do research. And so, um, also, there needs to be some um, training on what the best techniques and stuff regard in regards to growing uh, marijuana. And we want to make sure that small farmers have access, especially small Af African American farmers, because they seem to always be left out. They uh, get the scraps that was on the table, and it's time out for that. You know, people have worked very hard. They've had generational levels of poverty and not being a fresh uh, shake at the stick. So we just want to make sure that the, the field is level. This is, a new, this is a new Mississippi. And so we should be about being fair, equal, and just making sure everybody has access to opportunity. Today, the State Department of Health is reporting 1,210 more cases of the coronavirus and 40 deaths. That brings the totals in Mississippi to nearly 280,000 cases and more than 6,200 deaths since March of 2020. 
Governor Tate Reeves is extending an order that requires Mississippians to wear a mask in public in 75 of the state's 82 counties. That order is now extended to at least March 3rd. Health officials in Mississippi are concerned about Louisiana residents and those from other neighboring states coming over to get the coronavirus vaccine. The vaccine is available to residents and those who work in Mississippi from other states. Mississippi does not require identification or proof of eligibility to get the vaccine. The state has limited doses and health officials say they want to make sure there is enough for those in need. COVID-19 vaccinations are being administered at hospitals, community health centers, private clinics, and 21 state-run drive-through sites. Shots are available to health care workers, residents of long-term care facilities, anyone 65 or older, and anyone over 16 who has an underlying medical condition. So let's get straight to the point now with views from both sides of the aisle. Brandon Jones is an attorney and former Democratic member of the House. Austin Barber is a national Republican strategist and founder of the Clearwater Group. Brandon, Austin, good to have you both with us, as always. Uh, let's start with something that, frankly, I'm confused about, uh, Austin, this, this, uh, the medical marijuana program. We have the voters approve this constitutional amendment that really sets up a program, and yet you've got the legislature setting up, as, as was referred to there, a parallel program at the same time. What's, you can't have both, can you? You can't have both, and I'm a bit confused by it. Let's try to go back here for a second. Senator Blackwell um, has tried to move this bill at least last session, maybe the session before 2019, I, I can't remember. Um, but obviously what has happened since is, you know, the House or, you know, a majority of members in the legislature decided this is not a bill that we want to move forward. So uh, the supporters of medical marijuana move forward with a ballot initiative. 73% of the voters said, yes, we approve this, which added to our constitution and mandated the Department of Health to go create a medical marijuana program um, that would require them to come up with rules and regulations that would, you know, monitor those people who want to transport medical marijuana, grow medical marijuana, who want to be dispensaries, who want to test it, all these different things that have rules and regulations and requirements and fees and all these different things that are involved with it. Um, I would understand completely if Senator Blackwell's bill, and I think this was taken out in committee, said, you know what, this only becomes law if the Supreme Court uh, challenge that was filed by uh, uh, the mayor of Madison is successful and the Constitutional Amendment 65 is removed. Therefore, their Department of Health can't move forward with the program. That makes sense, that it would, it would be there just as a just-in-case type measure. Just-in-case uh, measure, but I believe that was removed um, in committee. So I'm confused because you can't have two parallel programs. We don't have two gaming, you know, programs. We don't have two lotteries that can, state lotteries that compete with each other. We don't have two foster programs, you know, and, and on and on and on. And I, I'm sure the intent is to not have two programs. But as Brandon and I always say, sometimes in legislature, it just takes time to get through the process to get this right. Right, Brandon? Well, I mean, we'll see. We went a long time without having one program, and so I guess now we're making up for lost time by having <laughs> multiple programs. You did hear, though, Senator Black will say that we could conceivably have to, and he seemed to be okay with that. He, he mentioned from a business perspective that that somehow made sense. I don't know that I agree with him on that. I certainly don't know that I agree with not having a centralized place to oversee both programs. That seems strange. Well, I mean, businesses should compete with one another. That's, that's the free market. But two governmental programs shouldn't compete with each other. It's like so the AFL I, and NFL back a long time ago. It's not like that at all, actually. <laughs> so I, I think I think with you know Senator Blackwell's intention is to have this in case there is, um, in case the Supreme Court rules that that 65 is, is not constitutional, but we'll follow the process and we'll see where it goes. There, there is another component to this, Austin, and I think we heard Representative Hines speak to it. There is a sense in which the vultures are now ascending, you know, descending. Uh, we didn't have folks that were highly supportive of this out front of this until they saw that 73% now that it's popular, now that they know people want this, now all of a sudden everybody seems to have their own marijuana plan, including those who didn't seem to care for the bill yeah. back when it was in development. And I do think he's right. The legislature should be paying attention to make sure that people do have access to this market, that people do have access to the programs 
because that is a place where they can actually do some productive work. Yeah, and I think Kevin Blackwell, and I know you probably won't refer to him, he's tried to work on this for, you know, for, for a number of years. Um, and I don't know if vultures ascend or descend. I just try to stay away from them. They come down. Stay away from them when they do. <laughs> All right, let's uh, move on to something we haven't talked about yet on this program uh, this evening yet, and that is uh, a a bill from Representative Trey Lamar that would uh, it proposes to create a new commission that would run the state division of Medicaid. Uh, What's going on with that? Well, I I don't know. I I know that correct me if I'm wrong, Brandon, but no state in the United States has a committee or a commission that runs their division of Medicaid. You know, this is. Why Mississippi would want to be the first, I don't understand the advantages of this. I, you know, I'm, I'm sure that Representative Lamar agrees with me and, and conservatives, because we would agree with him, that the way that you try to be conservative in, in reducing the size of government or, is to have these agencies report to the governor. The governor is the individual who is most responsible to every voter in the state of Mississippi. The voter gets, the, excuse me, the governor gets more votes than any other elected position. Therefore, if a division of Medicaid, which is the most complicated state agency in the history of state agencies, in my opinion, should be under the supervision of the governor. He's responsible to the to the uh, the people who are on Medicaid and the taxpayers who help fund Medicaid. The governor, our chief executive officer, is the individual who negotiates, corresponds, and communicates with the federal government, which funds most of a lot of Medicaid more than any other person in the state of Mississippi. So I I, I think that. This is um, a move that we really got to be cautious with. I'm for putting, you know, more agencies under the control of the governor, whether that's a Republican or a Democrat, because the governor, he or she is the one who's going to have to ultimately answer to the voters. Yeah, I think this is a good format for shows like this. Wilson, we just bring the Republican on and we turn to him and we say, what's up with that? What, what on earth are y'all doing? All right. Representative Lamar, I, I will say this. There's a subtext to this. Representative Lamar must be at odds with the governor's office. You do not file a bill like this unless you got beef. There's just no reason to bring this out. We know the governor doesn't like it. This is a major structural change. And so this does denote some type of riff. There must be some feelings remaining from that lawsuit that the governor won when he did a line item veto. That affected something that Representative Lamar wanted. I don't know that this is playing those types of games out through something as important as Medicaid is the way to do it. But I'll say this, Austin, for those of us who are on the progressive side of things in Mississippi, we would love to see Medicaid expansion. And I I don't know what it would take to get us there to have a more open dialogue about that, but this is a state that needs it. I would love to see that policy possibility show up. Well, well, and and I'm sure we described this, but we should say it again. Uh, If if HB 1013, which I think is... is, um Representative Lamar's uh, bill number, it would appoint seven committee members, four of them that would be appointed by the lieutenant governor and then three by the governor. So ultimately giving control to, to the legislature of this of this agency. So do you see that as a possible avenue toward Medicaid expansion? Well, I'll just say this. The lieutenant governor has been more open to that prospect than the governor has been. Uh, the lieutenant governor mentioned during his campaign that he was open to the concept of Medicaid expansion. We're one of only 12 states that hasn't taken advantage of, of that program. So, look, I, I, frankly, I don't think that's where this is headed. I don't think this bill is going to pass. But Medicaid expansion is on many minds when this we bring up this issue. Look, and Drew Snyder, who is the, who's the executive director of the Division of Medicaid, is doing a fantastic job. He was appointed by Governor Phil Bryant, reappointed by Tate Reeves. He's doing a great job of, of running Medicaid. I believe there's 750,000 people who are on Medicaid. It is a safety net program, and it's an important program. It's a program we got to get right uh, for you know a lot of single moms, a lot of little kids who are on this program, and we need to make sure that it is a program that's doing what it's supposed to do. And I know uh, Drew has done a good job with that. Brandon, what are some bills of significance, or bill or bills uh, that uh, that did or did not make uh, the deadline that either surprised you, disappointed you, made you happy? Well, there are still some bills out there that could do this, but I was hoping we would see, Wilson, a return to the parole bill that we saw last year. Uh, The governor vetoed a parole bill, so we knew that it wasn't going to be the same product. But we need something. The legislature needs to take action because our prisons are overcrowded, and we don't have staff sufficient to do what is required to make sure that people are safe, 
and to make sure that everything that happens within prison walls is, is done in a proper way. And we just saw our neighbor to the east, Alabama, get popped by the Department of Justice to the tune of probably more than a billion dollars to revamp its prison system. We know we are next. The Mississippi Department of Corrections is in the sight lines of the Department of Justice. If we do not figure out our prison situation and find a safe path to parole for thousands of people who are just stuck because our sentencing laws are too harsh, then we, we're going to have major fiscal problems down the road. And so I was hoping that we would see a very clear bill that was kind of in sync with what happened with what the legislation last year, but modified to satisfy some of the governor's concerns. And we've got a bit of a mess because the House has a version that's not fully developed. And then the Senate has a version that, frankly, is a little bit too prosecutor friendly and brings us back in the same position. We're not going to be letting anybody have a pathway to parole. So that's a huge issue facing the state. It could become the issue if the Department of Justice does to us what it did to Alabama. And we still don't have an answer. Yeah, I, I, it, maybe we're going to talk about Representative Lamar a lot this show. Um, but the, he does have House Bill 997, which I wanted to talk about, which removes ABC from under the control of the Department of Revenue, essentially privatizing uh, ABC, which has been it, it, this was probably debated when you were in the legislature, Brandon. So I think there are a lot of people who who like to go buy, you know, wine and liquor at, at liquor stores and, and at grocery stores and so forth. I guess you can't buy wine and liquor at grocery stores, but, you know, certainly can buy them at a liquor store. It, that's a really interesting uh, bill. I heard the lieutenant governor uh, on statewide radio the other day talking about um, the, the issues that ABC is having just with being underfunded and not having modern equipment. So it'll be really interesting to see where uh, Representative Lamar's bill goes. The focus used to be on sin taxes. Now we are trying to see how fast we can get marijuana and alcohol <laughs> to the mis citizens of Mississippi. It's an interesting day. do it the right way. It's still long <laughs> enough and, and things start to change. Gentlemen, thank you both. We are out of time. Don't forget, you can watch this program online or listen to the podcast at mpbonline.org. For day-to-day -day coverage, follow MPB News on Twitter and Facebook. We thank you for joining us. Have a good night. Thanks for listening to the At Issue podcast from MPB News. If you haven't already, subscribe to get new episodes weekly. And don't forget to like, rate, and leave a review. You can also stay in touch with MPB News on Twitter and Facebook. For daily news, check out the Mississippi Edition podcast. Thanks for listening.